Hello, listeners. This is Kat. Welcome back to Put Your Hands Up Podfix. This will be the continuation of All For You. This will be part three, day eight. In the end, All Might had to return to his agency and make sure his vaccinations were actually up to date before he could enter the NICU. While he was at his agency, he took the chance to change into some clothes that hadn't just been on the field. The nurses that had turned him away yesterday pointed out that patients in the NICU had immature immune systems and could not fight off infections very easily. Infections that could easily come from a dirty hero costume. The absolute last thing All Might wanted to do was harm those infants, infants struggling to survive when they should be thriving. Changing into something clean was the least he could do. He ended up wearing cargo pants, a white t-shirt, and a ball cap, which had the added benefit of letting him blend in a little. Emphasis on a little. This time, when he entered Tanima Memorial Hospital, he was able to get where he needed to. He was escorted to the entrance of the NICU, where a cockatoo woman in a purple blouse and black t-shirt was waiting for him. "'Hello, All Might. It's a pleasure to meet you,' she said with a grin, her feathers slightly puffed out, in what he could only assume was either excitement or apprehension, as she held out a hand. "'My name is Megumi Ito. I'm a social worker here in the NICU.' All Might gave her a grim smile, shaking her hand. "'Hello. I'm here for Hizashi Midoriya.' Ito nodded. "'Yes, I'm aware. I was notified you were coming, and Midoriya-san has warned me that you might not be enthusiastic about the sponsor form.' That was one way of putting it. I would like to see him, All Might forced out. Of course, Ito said. I assume your vaccinations are up to date. They are, I checked, All Might said, handing her his documentation. Ito scanned them quickly before handing them back. Good. I will escort you in, then, Ito said. She clasped her hands together and continued. Please be quiet and calm in the NICU. The patients are very sensitive and loud noises will disturb them. As per hospital rules, if you make too much of a disturbance, I'll have to call security and you will be escorted out. All Might nodded, and Ito turned around, opening the door of the NICU with her keycard. It was much quieter than the rest of the hospital. There were the beeps and whooshes of medical equipment, of course, but other than the business talk of the staff, all of whom surprisingly didn't react to him, All Might couldn't say he minded. Not today. And the whispering of families behind closed doors and curtains, it was oppressively quiet. The only door that was open was the one that he was being led to. The inside was dim, as if the lights were low and the curtains drawn. All Might squared his shoulders and readied himself, ready to face him, only to feel like the floor had been ripped out from under him five stories high. Because all for one, the greatest villain in Japan, the kingpin of all crime in the underworld, the killer of Nana Shimura, looked god-awful. He had been expecting the monster in his suit, leaning against a crib with a slimy grin, a triumphant look in his heartless eyes. That wasn't what he got. What he got was an exhausted man sitting in a standard-issued hospital recliner, hunched over, his head resting in his clasped hands, wearing scrubs that obviously didn't belong to him. He couldn't see his face. It was hidden, but he could see that his white hair was mussed and tangled, and that there was a slight tremble to his hands. The chair all for one was sitting in was positioned as close as it could be to, well, he wasn't sure what it was, but it wasn't a crib. It looked like something that belonged in a laboratory. All Might stared at it warily. Was it a weapon of some kind? Something moved inside. All Might stiffened, preparing himself, only to feel like he had been sucker-punched in the gut. The thing that moved was a foot. A foot that was barely bigger than the first joint of his thumb. There was a baby in there. A very, very small baby. Could babies that small even survive? Ito closed the door behind them. All for one shifted, and All Might snapped to attention. His blood-red eyes glinted in the dim room. His face was pale, cheeks hollowed out from the weight of exhaustion and hunger and dark bruises under his wary glare. I knew you would come. All for one was doing this to unbalance him. This was an act, to get the hospital to protect him, so he could see through whatever nefarious plan he had now. Rage flared to life under All Might's breastbone. How dare he? There were no parents around. What had he done to get his filthy hands on this child? Step away from the baby, All for One. All Might growled, his fist clenched. All for One's face twisted into something truly menacing. He did not move. If you think I'm stepping away from my son, you are even stupider than I thought, All for One said, slow and quiet. All Might blinked. He let out a laugh, incredulous. All for One truly had no boundaries, did he? The audacity he had to claim that baby, that innocent infant whose parents he probably killed, as his son, and the fact he thought All Might would fall for it. 
Your son, All Might scoffed. A monster like you couldn't have a son. All Might motioned to the baby beside the monster. That is just an innocent infant caught up in another one of your horrid plans that has failed. Now I won't say it again. Step away from the baby, All for One. All for One stood up slowly, his eyes pinned to All Might's, but he did not step away. Instead, he stepped in front of the baby, laying a hand gently on top of the plastic that arched over the infant. His name is Izuku. My wife, Inko, decided on the name. All for One started. Something in All Might recoiled violently at the thought of All for One having someone he could call a wife. Our relationship is why you've not been able to find me these past few years. Inko died in childbirth, and Izuku was born premature, so... All for One said, his eyes narrowing to cold slits. I'll say it again. Perhaps a little clearer as well, so your tiny brain will understand. All Might growled. If you... The only way I would ever leave Izuku's side is if I were dead. All Might stared, his face lax in shock. All for One shifted to stand more in front of the baby, his lips thinned in a grimace. All Might snarled, stepping forward. How dare you take advantage of someone so innocent and fragile! A piece of medical equipment alarmed by the baby. All for One whipped around to look at the infant. All Might froze. All for One's eyes were wide, almost afraid, if the word could be applied to him. And the villain had his back turned to All Might like it didn't even matter, like he didn't matter. All for One put one knee on the chair he had been sitting in and leaned over, resting a hand against the hard plastic covering the tiny infant. His feet were visible again, along with tiny hands as he jerked and wriggled in distress. Was he crying? All Might hadn't heard anything. All Might took a step back. He hadn't meant to disturb the baby. He had gotten carried away. Shh, it's okay, Izuku. All for one murmured. It's okay. You're safe here. You're okay. It's okay. There won't be any more scary sounds, I promise. The baby's movements slowed as he spoke, as if he were being calmed by All for one's voice. He never thought. Could he really be? No. Rage rose up and filled him to shaking. It had to be a quirk. Nothing else would make sense. A nurse rushed in behind him. Will he be okay? All for one asked the nurse. He sounded like every other concerned parent he'd heard at rescue sites. I believe it was the heart monitor that alarmed. The nurse looked at the baby, checked some of the equipment before, saying tersely, He should be fine. All for one let out a slow breath and said, Thank you, Anda. It's no problem, Midoriya-san. She said warmly before she turned to All Might and made a shooing motion. Now shoo! If you are going to yell, do it somewhere else. I'm not leaving, All Might snapped, though he did make sure his voice was quieter. Too right, you are not, All for One growled, standing up again and brushing off his scrubs. Ito, where is that room? Follow me, Ito said, from where All Might had forgotten her by his side. She turned and opened the door, walking with a purpose. All Might stepped aside and... Let All for One walk out first. He wouldn't make the same mistake All for One had made. He wouldn't leave his back open. The room All for One seemed to be talking about was an empty patient room. He kept walking even as Ito stepped aside to stand by the door. He stopped at a counter in the room looking for something. What are you doing? All Might growled. Ito, do you have a piece of paper and a pen? All for One asked with a sigh. Ito walked forward and handed him a paper pad and one of Tanima's branded pens. All for one took them both with a polite nod and set them on the counter. He propped himself up against it, his shoulders hunching and his head bowed. The villain took a deep breath. Then he began to write. What are you doing? All Might repeated, stepping closer. Proving something. All for one said tightly. He clicked the pen with finality, walked up to All Might and held the paper out. It shook slightly. There were addresses and names on it. The first address is for the Shimura family. I was planning on giving Nana's grandson a quirk, but I will not be doing so. The father is abusive. Do with that what you will. The second addresses are facilities containing experiments done by myself and a close associate. When the Nomu are in the tubes, they are inactive. Just kill them. They are animal experiments. The close associate's name is Dr. Daruma Ujiko, but his real name is Kuyadai Garaki. He works as a pediatrician in Jaku Hospital. Most of the philanthropic projects connected to him are also connected to me. Many of the orphanages he is connected to are also connected to his experiments. You should be able to find them and take them down through that information. All for one said. He shoved the paper at All Might's chest. All Might took it automatically. Now leave. 
You've upset Izuku and I'm out of patience, all for one said. All might look down at the paper, his eyes narrowed. There was every chance this could be the linchpin of all for one's plan, getting him to believe that he was telling the truth only to ambush any hero operations they undertook and cripple the heroes, but also... All Might looked back up at All for One. His eyes were still slitted, his mouth still pressed into an unhappy line, his face was still pale and gaunt, and the bags under his eyes looked anything but fake. The paper had been shaking when All for One held it out to him as if the tremor was still there. This isn't over, All Might bit out. You know where to find me, All for One replied, his voice suddenly beyond exhausted. All Might stepped aside and gestured at the door, All for One sighed and walked out. By the time All Might had stepped out after him, All for One was already disappearing into the baby's room. "'Thank you for visiting, All Might,' Ido said beside him. "'Would you like me to escort you out?' "'Yes, thank you. I would appreciate that,' All Might said with a sigh, folding up the piece of paper and putting it in his pocket. Hizashi collapsed into his chair, the moment he was close enough, his throbbing head laying in the crook of his crossed arms. This was day eight of no sleep. He was more exhausted than he had ever been in his life. His entire body, but especially his eyelids, felt like lead under the effect of a gravity quirk. He was beginning to see things out of the corner of his eyes. Paranoia and hallucinations born from exhaustion and stress he knew, and each and every time he saw one, he jumped to his feet to protect Izuku, only for nothing to be there. After that disastrous meeting, he only felt worse. Specifically, he felt like his head had just met the business end of a rock. Repeatedly. For hours. All he wanted to do was sleep. Truth be told, Hisashi had the suspicion that, if he stayed up much longer, he would become a detriment to Izuku's safety, which was the last thing he wanted. But he couldn't go to sleep. He couldn't miss anything. Especially not after All Might had spooked his son. Izuku's heart couldn't handle such things. He couldn't tell if All Might was being purposefully cruel to spite him or just being an idiot. Hisashi lifted his head up, rubbing his aching temples as he let out a slow sigh. He just needed to keep going until either he dropped or until the Bakugos came. They would probably let him sleep for a couple of hours. They had been hoping to come yesterday, or was it earlier today? Either way, they would be coming soon. Izashi propped his elbows up, balancing his head on his interlaced fingers, and watched Izuka's chest rise and fall. His heart monitor beeped steadily, thankfully back to normal after All Might's outburst. He was curled in a ball, physician aides helping him stay in place, he was wearing a tiny yellow hat with a cheerful sun stitched into it. "'Are you feeling better, Izuku?' Hisashi asked softly, watching his son closely. Izuku's forehead wrinkled like he was furrowing his brows, his arm jerked up, as if to cover his face. Hisashi huffed, but said nothing else. Izuku might as well have told him shut up, but he didn't mind. Hisashi wanted to make sure he wasn't overwhelmed, especially not after today. He was all too eager to keep Izuku happy and comfortable." He could give Izuku a hand hug to help calm him down, which was essentially just Izashi cupping Izuku's tiny feet and putting his other hand on Izuku's head, something the staff had had him do to wake up Izuku before they took blood or did a diaper change. They said it was a nicer way for him to wake up as opposed to just being jabbed with a needle, and the consistent pressure was similar to the walls of a womb, so it was comforting to Izuku. He could understand that. That being said... He didn't particularly feel comfortable doing any more than offering his finger to Izuku without staff oversight. Really, it scared him how much power this tiny infant already held over him. Izashi had worked so hard for so long to make sure he was the one in control at the top of the food chain to make sure not even death itself could command him. Yet here he was, answering to the beck and call of an infant that weighed little less than two cans of beans. And he wasn't even mad about it. Izashi sighed again and put his head in his hands, palms pressing into his eyes to provide even the slightest bit of relief. Contingencies. He needed to think about contingencies. He was locked into the decision to tear down his empire. He had his moment to falter. When Ito and All Might's eyes were on his back, the weight of what he was casting off was heavy. He was throwing away over a century of work, decades of research, manipulation, connections, and power struggles, all gone from his grasp. All for the chance of keeping his son by his side. Was it worth it? His mind told him no. His mind told him he was being a fool, the kind of fool he had always mocked and mused. But the weight of Izuka's hand on his finger was an anchor to his heart, and not even his greed could lead him back to business as usual. He was far past the point for second chances or second guessing, yet here he was. Now he was at the mercy of a society that hated him, 
desperately clinging to the last of his family. Again. He was sure his brother would be laughing at him now, if he were here. Nevertheless, it was too late for doubts. Hizashi needed a plan. The chances of all might actually signing that form and allowing him to stay by Izuku were lower than he really wanted to ponder. So he needed a backup plan for Izuku. He needed a place that would care for him regardless of who his father was. The simple fact of the matter was that Izuku would not be a normal child. He would likely have medical complications from early birth that would require extra, if not extensive, care. Hizashi knew he would be willing to do whatever Izuku needed. If he was willing to tear down his empire, he was willing to learn his way around some medical terms and equipment. But would anyone else? He did have some purely civilian contacts who had struck deals with him for quirks and had families. But if he approached them to ask them to take care of his child, they would only say yes out of fear. Or if they didn't say yes, he would have to coerce them into agreement. Regardless, Izuku would likely not get the level of care he needed, and Hizashi was not going to leave his son in subpar care if he could help it. Was there anyone Inko knew? Someone Inko knew would be better than any of his contacts when it came to child care. Oh, he was far too tired for this. Mitsuki, Masaru, the Bakugos, they adored Inko, and they, at least from their calls, were already invested in Izuku's well-being. There were a few problems with them, though. For one, they were already expecting. One newborn child was plenty of work, so he'd heard and hoped to find out. Two would most certainly be overwhelming, both in time and in money. Babies were expensive, medically complicated babies even more so. If Hizashi had to hand him over to the Bakugos, that would mean that his considerable resources would be likely tied up in the investigations he was now locked into. Perhaps he could donate them some clean money that would not be at risk of confiscation, or perhaps he could set up a trust fund for Izuku or sell some stockpiled valuables he likely had somewhere. Hizashi shook his head. He could think about money later. Right now, he needed to make sure Izuku would have good guardians if he was out of the picture. Beyond the money issue, there was also the fact that they did not know who he was. Mitsugi and Masaru only knew him as Hizashi, Enko's husband. They could very well refuse once they found out who he truly was. They were still Izuku's best option, which was well and good, but he needed more than one truly viable option. He had to have more than one backup for Izuku. He just needed to think. Surely there was someone else Inko had known. Hizashi sat there for who knows how long, thinking in circles. He startled when there was a soft knock at the door. He stared. Malicious hordes glared at him from his peripheral vision. Their eyes and teeth glinted in the shadows, hands clawing at the floor, attempting to bring themselves into being. They reached out to Izuku like hungry sharks, eager to feast, now that his Achilles' heel was bleeding into the water. Hizashi's stomach dropped. Fear was an adversary. He avoided for a long time, but it choked him here, seeping into his body like a parasite. He kept staring at the door. They weren't really there. Izuku was fine. He was not going to be a detriment to his son's safety. It was just a nurse. The nurse knocking had surprised him. That was all it was. He was certain. Yes? Hizashi asked. The door opened, and Aoi peeked in. Aoi was a night shift nurse, and typically came in on the same days of the week Onda worked. She had blue skin, which was probably her quirk, and came in every single day with a different pair of shoes. She grinned brightly at him. You have a visitor, Midoriya-san. He hoped it wasn't all might again. The door opened wider. A head of spiky brown hair came into view. Masaru. It was just Masaru, and the nurse had knocked to let him in because his arms were full of bags. Hizashi let out a slow breath, forcing himself to relax. Oh, uh, thank you, Masaru said, trailing off. Owie! Thank you, Aoi, Masaru said, bowing politely. Of course, let me know if you need anything, Aoi said, her eyes flitting to Hizashi. And maybe see if you can get him to sleep, too. Hizashi huffed, but Aoi was gone before he could say anything intelligent in reply. Masaru turned around, blinked. Oh, Hizashi, you look terrible. When was the last time you slept? Hizashi rubbed his eyes and dragged a hand down his face. I'm aware, he said, smiling wryly. As for the last time I slept, I would rather not say. Masaru whistled. All right, well, I'll just help you unpack the essentials and then you can get some rest. Mitsuki is coming by soon and we can keep an eye on the Suku. He said, hauling the bags to the couch by the windows, which were drawn to keep the room dim. Izashi watched him but made no move to leave Izuku's side. Masaru paused by the hospital bed in the room, which was noticeably untouched. Hizashi. Masaru said, his fingers stroking the starched sheets. 
You haven't slept at all, have you? Izashi looked away from him, first to his hands, then to Izuku. His chest was rising and falling steadily, his eyes firmly shut in sleep. I couldn't miss anything, he admitted. Masu walked closer, his footsteps loud in the sterile silence, until he was standing next to Izashi's chair. May I? he asked quietly. Izashi hesitated. You can talk to him. He doesn't handle touch well, and he hasn't been able to leave the incubator yet, he said. Selfishly, he hoped Izuku didn't have as much of a reaction to Masaru's voice as he did to his. All right. Masaru leaned over, pressing his fingers to the plastic gently. Hello, Izuku, he cooed. You were just a bit too excited to see the world, huh? Izuku's only reaction was to shift in place slightly. Masaru stepped back. He's beautiful, Hizashi, he said wistfully. Hizashi stared at his son. Beautiful would not be the word Hizashi would use. Tiny and fragile for sure, but beautiful. Izuku looked like a little old man. But Hizashi tilted his head. Izuku's button nose was small and precious, his tiny hands soft and delicate, his wispy hair endearing. Hizashi hadn't had the opportunity to see Izuku's eyes much. He spent much of his time sleeping, but he knew they were a sweet, dainty blue. He knew they may not remain so as Izuku aged, but for right now, they were a quintessential baby blue. Izuku's pink tongue pushed out of his mouth, as if he were dreaming of milk, something he was not yet healthy enough to try. His eyes stung slightly. He supposed he could see beautiful. Here, Masaru said, tugging his arm up. I'll keep watch over him, and you get some rest, all right? Izashi hesitated. I'll make sure you won't miss anything. I'll watch him, as if he were my own. Masaru reassured. As if he were his own. Izashi reluctantly stood up, letting Masaru take his place. Slowly, he let himself meander toward the bed, only to walk past it and toward the bags Masaru had placed on the couch. As if he were his own. As if Izuku were Masaru's own. He knew the Bakugos were Izuku's best backup plan. He knew he needed to tell them that they were a backup plan at all. And presumably why Izashi would need a backup plan. He didn't want to ask because that meant fully acknowledging the precarious situation he was in, but he also could not rest before he asked, because he would never be able to sleep. Making the responsible decision, Izashi decided to distract himself by unpacking some of the bags Masaru had brought. He went for the smallest one there. Ah, Izashi said, a wistful smile on his face. He knew what that was. Delicately, he pulled the baby blanket out of the bag and let it unroll, holding it up by the corners. The blanket was... Soft, Scottish lace. That was a light mint green, little bunnies woven into the design of the blanket. Izuku's name was embroidered in the center. Oh, Inko said, hopping to her feet at the sound of the doorbell ringing. Izashi looked up from his book with a raised eyebrow, watching her walk, skip really, to the door. Normally, he had heard all about whatever Inko had coming in the mail. She could never really keep it a secret, always too excited to share what had caught her interest. He found it endearing. There was a sound of tearing plastic in the kitchen of their small apartment. He had wanted to get Inko and him a proper place to live, something spectacular, for the wife that had stolen his black heart. But she was attached to this little apartment so close to her best friend. So he acquiesced. He would convince her some day. A house with a yard was better for the baby anyway. She would see that soon enough. He could probably arrange for one close to the Bakugos. She gasped excitedly in the kitchen. His auntie closed his book with a sigh, moving to get up. He wanted to see what his wife had managed to keep secret. Ah, 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 Inko said in a sing-song voice from the kitchen. Stay there, Hizashi, and close your eyes. I want it to be a surprise. Hizashi huffed but sat back, obediently closing his eyes. I'm at the edge of my seat, Inko. She walked back in quickly, and soon enough, something soft was placed in his hands. Hizashi peeked open one eye. There was a pile of fabric in his hands. His brows furrowed, and he opened both eyes as he held the fabric up. He blinked. Laughter bubbled up in his chest as he bundled the baby blanket again, running his fingers over the embroidered name in the center. Inko, he chuckled. We only just found out about the baby's sex. You've already settled on a name. Inko sat down next to him, her hand on her stomach, and a glowing grin on her face. It's a nice name, don't you think? His auntie leaned over to peck her cheek. If you like it, I like it. He folded up the blanket, his fingers running over the embroidered Izuku in the center. How many blankets are we going to have when he is born, Inko? Inko's eyes sparkled mischievously. Izashi burst out laughing. 
It was the only blanket Inko had managed to get. Mizuki made sure I brought that, Masaru said from his seat by Izuku. Inko told her all about that blanket. Yes. She was very excited about it. Izashi said softly. He bundled up the blanket and ran his fingers over the soft fabric. I'll have to ask if they can put this in the incubator with him. He walked back toward the bed slowly, looking intently at the patterns on the baby blanket. He sat down on the edge of the bed and ran his fingers over Zuko's embroidered name. He didn't want to have this conversation, but he couldn't sleep if he didn't. Masaru. His ashi started, Masaru peeked around the chair, blinking curiously. Before I met Inko, I was involved in some less than upstanding work, and it looks like it's about to catch up with me. His ashi said, still looking at the blanket. I'm doing what I can to keep custody. But if I can't... Izashi looked up at Masaru's shocked expression. Would you and Mitsuki be willing to take in Izuku? I... Of course, Izashi, Masaru said. Izashi slumped with relief. But I don't think you have anything to worry about. You'll be a great father, Masaru said, forcing his voice to be cheerful. Thank you, Masaru. It... Means more than you know, Hizashi said softly. Of course, Masaru said. Get some rest, Hizashi. Hizashi lay down on the hospital bed, as took his little baby blanket still in his hands. He turned off his stamina quirks and was out the instant his eyelids closed. He did not dream. All right, listeners, this concludes day eight of All For You. Day nine will be next. I hope you all are enjoying still. Let me know your thoughts and reactions, and as always... Thank you so much for listening.